Welcome to the Conscious Classroom Podcast, where we're exploring tools and perspectives that support educators and anyone who works with teens to create more conscious, supportive, and enriching learning environments. I'm your host, Amy Edelstein, and I'll be sharing transformative insights and easy to implement classroom supports that are all drawn from mindful awareness and systems thinking. The themes we'll discuss are designed to improve your own joy and fulfillment in your work and increase your impact on the world we share. Let's get on with this next episode. Hello, my name is Amy Edelstein. Welcome to this episode of The Conscious Classroom. This episode of The Conscious Classroom, we're going to talk about the ubiquitous camera on, camera off. If you are like myself or thousands, hundreds of thousands of teachers around the country and around the world, you're probably teaching some version of all online or a hybrid of online and in person. And one of the big questions is, do you ask your students to camera up? Do you let them choose on their own? Or do you leave them with the option to always be camera off? It's very hard to know what your students are doing. It's very hard to see their faces if they're confused or bored or worried if their cameras are off. At the same time, we can't always require our students to come online. Many students, particularly in middle school years, are experiencing a lot of anxiety being on camera. As you know, when you're looking into the camera and you're on the other end, it feels like somebody's looking right at you middle school students who are already fairly self-conscious and challenged feel like other students are staring at them and they feel self-conscious and sometimes our expressions are unselfconsciously bored or confused or our faces get scritched up because when we're trying to figure something out And students can take that personally. They think that their classmates are making fun of them, which of course they probably are not. So do you require your students to camera up? There are equity issues. Students who come from more challenged backgrounds or who have a lot going on at home, discord between parents, caregivers, siblings, visitors, don't want to reveal that on camera. They don't want to invite their classrooms into their houses. And forcing them to camera up can create tension between a student and whoever else is in the home who wants and requires that privacy. It can be embarrassing to them. Maybe they don't want to show their background. Maybe it's not as tidy as they would like it to be. Maybe there are too many people there. And maybe some are undocumented. And there's, there are many, many challenges to students, particularly those who come from families of poverty where they don't have much choice about the room they're in or their background or who's with them. But students of affluence have difficulty with cameraing up as well. In this session, I'm going to share some ways to increase participation, to encourage students to become involved. And when they become more involved, it's easier for them to camera up. They'll feel like they're in an environment of friends, of a teacher they're in a relationship with, rather than just being told to reveal themselves and you know, have that sense of standing exposed in front of a screen. When you're part of a group, when you're part of an interaction, when you're part of a relationship, it's much easier to feel inclined to turn your camera on and see everyone else and get to know them. 
the way I like to start my online classes these days is to ask a personal question that's not too personal and have all the students as they come in enter their responses in the chat. So this could be share a rose, a thorn, or a bud, or all three. Share a rose, a thorn, and a bud. So rose is something really good that happened. A thorn is something that's irritating, not so good. And a bud is something you're looking forward to. I always share first, and it's obviously something classroom appropriate. It helps humanize me get the students to know me and it encourages them to share as well and oftentimes what I get is the rose is I got a good grade on my project my thorn is I'm worried about my presentation later today my bud is the weekends coming up these answers give you cues that you can respond to worried about presentation the mindfulness exercises we're going to do today are going to help ground you. And as we do them, I'm going to remind you of how you can use them right before your presentation or if your mind goes blank in the middle. You can use the things that they're sharing to make the mindfulness more relevant, more immediately useful. I've had students share, I'm worried I have coronavirus, I'm waiting for my test, my brother is coming home from the hospital today. Those are options and cues to following the next, you know, I hope you don't have coronavirus, I hope you're okay. Next week, how are you doing? Did you get your test back? Yes, thank you, it's negative, thanks for asking. My brother is coming home from the hospital, that's wonderful, I'm so happy for you, you must feel so relieved. You can do quick responses like that that help create some relational uh, engagement without requiring students to come on camera, but really that do feel more localized, more personal, and enable you to respond in a natural way that you would if the students were walking into the class and you were saying hello to them as they walked in. Now, after we do that, and go into the beginning of the class, you can find an activity where before you go into it, you can invite them to open up their cameras and say hello just for five seconds. I just want to be able to put a face to a name. I haven't met all of you in person, so I'm not sure who I'm talking to. So quick five seconds open your camera, let's all wave hello, thanks very much. Most students will be willing to do that. It's a flurry of activity. You can't really recognize everyone that quickly, but it's a very low bar of entry. It's non-invasive, it's not authoritative. You're inviting in order to be in relationship. And most students want to know that they're seen. They don't want to be stared at, but they want to know that you, as their teacher, know who they are. So a simple invitation like that can help be an icebreaker. And sometimes I invite them to come on camera. We're going to do some mindful movement, and I want to make sure that your um, working your neck and your shoulders in a way that's not going to be cause strain. So if you feel comfortable, if you'd like, you can put your camera on, but sit back from the screen, find a nice shape or color in the room that you can focus on, or put your gaze outside the window as we do some mindful movement. So you're inviting them to be on camera, so that you can help guide them without forcing them to look at you or anyone else, allowing them to sit back. And when they sit back like that, then they feel less exposed. You don't need to have your students on camera 
to do mindful movement. Let's try a little mindful movement right now, just with this audio podcast. Of course, if you're driving, please don't do this. But if you're not driving, put down uh, your, your pencil or pen and the list you're making, or uh, sit back from the keyboard and the email you're writing. And let's take just a short minute and a half, two minutes to stretch our bodies out. And you'll see that you don't need your students to be on camera in order to work with them in this way. So take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, extend your arms straight up over your head so that your elbows are hugging your ears and your fingers are reaching towards the sky. Let gravity stretch your spine, pulling your lower back in down so that you're seated solid on the chair while your arms extend up. And let your shoulders drop. Let them roll, fall away from your ears while you keep your fingers reaching towards the sky like branches in the spring, growing that extra leaf at the edge. And now like turn your palms towards the floor, let your arms flow down your sides, stretching out to the sides of you. So your, your arms make a T with your head in the middle. Let your shoulders roll back. Extend your arms even a little bit more. Feel the tingling as your muscles wake up and your blood flows. And now let your hands float and arms float all the way down to your sides, to the sides of your chair. Let them relax, let them be loose. Give your shoulders a little shake. Take a deep in breath and a deep out breath. And feel the energy that's activating in your arms already. You stretched your capillaries, you stretched all the little nerves, waking them up. And now drop your right ear to your right shoulder, feeling the stretch on the left side of your neck. Letting gravity Coax your head down towards your shoulder without strain. Lift your right hand and let your right hand touch your left ear. So it's folded over your head, just kissing your ear with your hand, letting the weight of your arm gently stretch the left side of your neck. And release your arm, let your head float back to center and drop your left ear to your left shoulder. Feel the stretch in the right side of your neck. Lift your left arm up, let your left hand just kiss your right ear. Letting the weight of your arm gently pull your head down to your shoulder, stretching the right side of your neck. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Release your hand, let your head float back to center. Give your shoulders a little shake. Give your head a little shake, side to side, up and down, yes and no, and bring it back to center. Now hold on to the edges of your chair or the arms of your chair and press your lungs and ribs forward, arching your back. pulling your shoulder blades together. And 
And now make a C with your body, allowing your spine to push back towards your chair, rolling your shoulders forward, doing a seated cat and cow. Pressing your chest forward, your shoulders back, looking up, and rolling your shoulders in, allowing your spine to make a C, dropping your head forward. Let's do it one more time. Pressing forward and rolling into a C shape and coming back to center. And for our last movement, take your right hand over your left knee or onto the left arm of the chair and twist your spine, wringing out your spine like it was a wash rag, looking over your left shoulder. Come back to center. Take your left arm, reach it over to the right side of your chair. Look over your right shoulder, wringing your spine out like it was a wash rag. And coming back to center. Notice how you feel. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. You can encourage your students to invite them, invite anyone else they have in their house to do the mindful movement together with them. We all need a little more exercise than we're getting these days. So you can welcome them to invite those who are in the room with them, in the house with them, to take a little mindful movement break. We're normalizing what's happening with other people being around. Students usually don't have their families around when they're in the classroom, but there they are. They're having to learn with their families uh, literally right over their shoulders. So we can invite, we can encourage them to include their families without us invading their home space. We're not asking to see who's there. We're not asking them to come on camera. We're inviting the students to welcome those they live with to do the mindful movement with them. So their, their families are being asked to do the mindful movement by the student, not to do the mindful movement with us as the teacher. So this creates a little bit of a bridge, but it also helps with bonding uh, between the students and those in their household over something that they wouldn't ordinarily do together. If you are inviting students to camera up or they do camera up and there are issues happening in the home around them, Keep your comments only related to that student and to the work at hand. So if there's yelling in the background, if there's cursing in the background, if there's crying in the background, without calling the student out, without bringing more attention to their situation, which they may already feel embarrassed about, you can include them you can keep going. You can mute them if it's very loud. You can invite them to chat. You can invite them to put their answer in by text. Be sensitive to what's happening for students and remember that they're very self-conscious around their environment. They're very concerned about being judged. They're very concerned about what others will think of them and what their family members may think of being exposed online. Be sensitive 
let them remain as anonymous as possible. And obviously, if there's anything that you become aware of that you feel needs further investigation, you know, take it to the counselor, take it to the principal, and follow up if you feel that there may be harm uh, towards your student or towards anyone in the household. But that's not something to bring attention to in the class. The final way I want to share with you to uh, invite students to be on camera is to do an activity in class that requires some kind of drawing. It doesn't have to be artistic, but making a, a diagram or a chart and then sharing that on camera so they're not exposing their face or their surroundings, but they're sharing their work. Now with the mindfulness, one way we do that is with the body scan. So you can invite students to get a blank piece of paper and a pen or some art materials if they have crayons or markers at home and draw a stick figure and show them how to draw a stick figure and then take them through a beautiful guided body scan and invite them to illustrate that stick figure with color or shape according to what they noticed. Our bodies are uh, experiencing sensations all the time. As we practice mindful awareness, we're noticing good sensations, bad sensations, and how physical feelings move and change all the time. It's normal. You can put a rectangle where your body felt dense or heavy or stiff. You could put a star where you felt like your body felt light. You could illustrate with color or in any other shape. Just noticing the sensations and the blank spaces that you felt in your body. When you finish the body scan and you give them time to work on their diagrams, now let's all open our cameras, hold your illustration up so we can see, oh, look how many people had sensations in their arms. Look how many people had sensations in their neck. Oh, look, somebody had bright yellow uh, spraying out from their hands. That must, looks like it felt good. Was that a good feeling? So you can comment on the drawings. You can point out the similarities. You can point out the commonalities. You can point out the differences. You can ask questions and invite further response. In this way, very low tech, you can encourage students to become relational even in the online world. Learning how to teach in the virtual environment is an art and it's an iterative process. We're going to try one thing on one day. It's going to work for periods one, two, and three. And periods four, five, and six, it's going to flop. We just keep trying. Resist the temptation to turn your evenings into an industrial light and magic or Disney studio where you're trying to create video and audio and uh, you know, complicated shapes and colors. None of us have time for that. And it's not necessary to create relationship. The most important thing is addressing your students by name, coming up with questions they can all write into the chat, sharing appropriate pieces of yourself so that in ways that would invite them to share and creating some positivity and some relational engagement 
without forcing the uh, cameras on. At the same time, the more you can encourage cameras on, the more students will be able to bond with each other, to have easier discussions, to make friends with students who they might not have met yet, especially freshmen in high school who are navigating new schools, new environments, inviting students to find ways to meet each other, talk with each other, wherever you can facilitate that in small groups, in breakout rooms, putting the cameras on, just with two or three other students, visiting the rooms yourself to create safety, um, is all helpful in, at this time. We can see the end in sight where we're going to be able to spend time with each other again in person. But these next months are going to be a challenge for students as well as for teachers. The more close we feel, the more we feel like we're in this together, uh, the easier it's going to be. And the more you can use the practice of mindfulness to help students feel comfortable with being alone, with being still, with being quiet, creating intimacy and friendship connection through the stillness, the better the students will be able to navigate these months ahead. So I wish you all well. If you have any suggestions that have been working for you in your classroom, please do email me through the website innerstrengthfoundation.net. And if you like this podcast, do leave a review to encourage others to listen in. Stay healthy and be well. Till next time. Thank you for listening to The Conscious Classroom. I'm your host, Amy Edelstein. Please check out the show notes on innerstrengthfoundation.net for links and more information. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend and pass the love on. See you next time.